I want to talk to you about the topic of heroes, but specifically through the lenses of female heroes. So um, as you know, those of you who know me, I spent my whole life, um, a huge part of my life, trying to empower um, um, Noshim Tzidkanios, young ladies, uh, all kinds of women to be able to reach their potential, to feel good about what they do, and to reach heights and um, whatever it's called, empowerment, to give women the ability to empower themselves, but within the framework of Terra Halacha. In other words, without compromising even ki even a little drop of what means their um, their uh, their Terra values. Um, the system works against you. There's no question about it in my mind. Um, the system works very much against you. Um, the whole of American society, wherever you're from, Canada, England, South Africa, society basically gives you a message that you need to be out there. You need to, uh, so, to speak, so to speak, flaunt yourself uh, to be successful. Uh, you need to be able to, uh, to uh, your name is in print, all news is good news, all the things that they tell you. And indeed, if you look at the brochures, I'm not going to mention by name, but there are uh, some prestigious uh, uh, Orthodox universities, colleges that have their brochures, and they'll have at the very beginning examples of their of their um, esteemed graduates who have made it in the big world. And um, I'm not detracting at all from what they write. I think it's wonderful. Uh, you want to become a whatever. You want to become open up a company, run a company. You want to run a school. You want to be a judge. You want to be, I don't know, a marathon runner. Choose whatever it is that is for you, um, um, empowerment, and, and be the best. If that's what you want to do, power to you, sister. But the problem is, is that at the same time, you have your teachers who are um, bringing you the maramakomos of what is the traditional way of a Torah woman. And it's a little bit of a different narrative. Uh, I just wanted to share with you a story. I always... Um, I always love this story. This story makes me feel very good. Uh, I work in the Vey, and in the Vey Yerushalayim, there was a young lady who was going through the process of gerus, of conversion. <clears throat> and she comes up to me and she said she was given an offer to be a, um, to be a star in a movie that follows the process of the transition of gerim from beforehand to afterwards. Uh, they took five, um, five, five uh, um, gerim in, in process. They wanted her to be one of them. She was a perfect candidate from their view to point, view, view, point, to, point of view. She was very presentable. Uh, she came from a phenomenal, famous non-Jewish home. And uh, she was in the way. Everything was perfect for her. So I asked her, um, she asked me, Rabbi Nissel, should I or should I not do this? So I asked her, so, so what do you think? Uh, and what, what is your viewpoint? I wanted to feel her out. And this is what she said to me. She said to me, Rabbi Nissel, I am converting to Judaism. One of the things that has attracted me to become Jewish is the Jewish concept of, of modesty. I don't think she knew yet to say the word tznias or tzniyot. She said the word modesty. If I understand correctly, modesty in the Jewish viewpoint is nothing to do with how much clothing you wear, but rather it's the idea that the Jewish life is the private life. The Jewish life is, doesn't have to be visible. No one has to see you. You do things uh, you do things within the confines of your own home. Um, uh, the the compliment, the first compliment that I know of in the Torah is the angels complimenting Avram Ravinu. Now, Avram did not need Chizuk in his marriage, but nevertheless, they complimented her, him and said, Sara, Ishtecha, Sara, she is in the, she's in the tent, like, woohoo, go you, 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 you hit the, you hit the winner, Sara Imenu was a very, very powerful lady. In, in Chazal, she's called Gvura de Chesed. She is the power behind the Chesed of Avravinu, and she is complimented in the eyes of Avravinu by the Malachim by saying that she's in the tent. So how's this going to work out for you ladies? How's it going to work out for anyone uh, that wants to do it both? To be honest with you, it applies equally well to men. It's just more painful for women. I have my own obligation to live a tzanua life, and this is exactly the tzniyas for men as well, is that uh, I do not want my face in print. Actually, it, it just happens to be that I, my, my whole family is laughing at me because there's a Pesach program 
featuring Rabbi Nissel. So they had a picture of me, and it's from like 15 years ago. I don't know how they found it. Seriously, I look like I'm, I look like I'm basically, I can't, whatever. I look like a child in the picture. And the whole thing is just like, no, okay, okay I don't, I hate it when I see my picture in Mishpacha magazine. Um, but what can I do? What can I do? This is the price you have to pay if you want to take your wife away for Pesach. This is the price you have to pay. But the bottom line is, is that the tearaway is, uh, even though we say kol kvuda bas melech pnima, but kol kvuda ben melech pnima is as well. It's equally true that the power of our tzaddikim and gedolim and all the people that you and I have ever respected is that they always craved that moment of privacy, the moment of aloneness with themselves or with their families outside of the eyes of people watching them. And the secular world works in the opposite direction. If you want to succeed, you have to be out there. <clears throat> so I want to talk about a woman called Miriam. Miriam uh, is now the parshish that you and I are reading. Uh, we're now in uh, from Shemos going into Veira. Uh, Miriam is now question one of the greatest women of all time. Is any of you ladies of Miriam? To know, we just, I would just know we got Suri's and Rebecca's and Rachel's and Zahavas and Sippies and more Rachel's and Mayan and and then various initials. Ah, oh, Aracheli. There's no Miriam. If there was a Miriam, it's in your honor that I'm saying this, because Miriam was, without question, uh, the Jewish hero of the Exodus. I know that technically speaking, she's female, and therefore she's called a heroine. But today, I don't know what it is. I feel awkward talking about a Jewish heroine. It just doesn't sound right. It sounds like she's shooting up something. And so we'll just call her a Jewish hero and just be on the safe side. And Miriam is a Jewish hero. There's no question about her. She starts off her career that she is defying the authorities. She does not care. She literally puts her life online. And most normal dictators would kill a Jewish woman that defies his orders. It was a nace in its own right. The power did not kill her and her mother, Yecheved. Miriam goes on to be the inspiration of the Jewish woman at the Exodus. Um, she goes out and uh, she, uh, she, she, she tells the women to take out their instruments because they've got to sing Shira. Um, unfortunately for me, it was a tambourine. I used to have this a child. I used to picture Miriam as bringing out like a 15 piece drum set and having like a Jimi Hendrix, like, you know, headband and just like slaying it in front of the ladies. But no, that's not, that's not what happened. He was this Tadekas with a thing, with a tambourine. Actually, another time we could talk about the connection between female and tof and drummings. Drumming is basically the most physical of all the instruments and she was taking the most physical and she was elevating it. It doesn't stop there. In the Sfarim Hakadoshim, we know that she was the teacher of the ladies. She wasn't just the greatest teacher of the ladies, but rather she's called in the Sfarim Hakadoshim as the Ima of Ter Shvalpeh. Ter Shvixav is masculine. Ter Shvalpeh is feminine. In the world of Kla Yisrael, that's Moshe and Miriam. So Miriam has what's called the Be'er Shal Miriam. 40 years, Kla Yisrael survived on water from, um, from Miriam. And that Be'er Shal Miriam was a source of intellectual inspiration as well. As you're probably aware, um, the, the Arizal took his Talmud, the Reb Chaim Vital, into the middle of the Kinneret, and there he found this the place where the Be'er Miriam was hidden, and he gave him to drink, and it opened up the fountains of wisdom. From Miriam, this great woman, Miriam, is where the source of where it all comes from. So it's no question. You call your daughter Miriam, you're giving her a name of empowerment. You're giving her a name of, of, of a great woman, an Isha Gedoyla, an Isha Gedoyla in all senses of the world. Now, here comes the problem. We have a tradition. The Gra writes about this. Um, uh, Tadaka Kohen of Lubin writes about it. If you want to know about something, find where it is written in the Torah for the first time. This applies to a word, a letter, a concept, and also a person. So if you want to find the essence of a person, go and see where they are found the first time. Where is Miriam found for the very first time? So I can already see by your smiles on your faces that, yeah, you know what's about to happen next. It is at the beginning of Parsha Shemos. Um, Shifra, Pua. 
זאת רש"י, שפרה זה יחבת שמשפרת את הוולד, פועה זה מרים, שפועה מדברת והגה לוולד כדרך הנשם המפייסס תינאי הביכה. So, um, I don't know if any of you are studying nursing, but uh, I was zeicha. The truth of the matter is here in Israel, they don't let the husbands in. Uh, but the, but uh, when I had a son in America, so I actually got to see this green slime that is covering the color vernix, right? It's not really greenish, but it's like whitish green thing. And uh, the magic hands, the magic hands of the, of the holy uh, Mialdais, they take this, your, the, your child, Bez Hashem, to all of you, and they, with a couple of seconds, they clean it with their magic hands, and uh, they, they put the, you know, sometimes through the, through the trauma of childbirth, you have discombobulated limbs, and they return the baby to the mother, clean, happy, and smelling good. Now, um, if you go to California, I don't know where you guys are from, I've seen this with my own eyes, it is a tradition that they play at weddings this um, beautiful country song that has been turned awful by placing it into the context of a Jewish wedding called I Held You First. And it's always sung by the father to his daughter, the bride. And, uh, and everyone goes, it's so beautiful. Yeah, he held her first. Not true. Not true. The person that held you first was some lady who probably, probably a lady who no one knows who it is. My father used to tease me. Uh, when I was a child, I was born on literally on Friday the 13th during a storm in a hospital that was soon destroyed. And uh, probably in London, okay, whatever, 1961, uh, uh, some wonderful nurse took care of me. Uh, probably Jamaican, right? Kid, I don't know. I don't want to like, uh, and the probably the first song that was sung to me could have been a Jamaican lullaby. And that is moving on to Miriam, who is called Pua. And she used to take the child from the Shifra, and then sing a, sing a song, and it was called the Pua song. So the Brits, who are unfortunately extremely twisted and all our lullabies somehow or other have to be dark, it's in a bloodstream. rock a -bye, baby on a treetop, the baby shall fall, the baby shall rot. What's with the Brits? Why do they have to do that? But the point is, is that the original song was the poo 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 poo, -poo and Miriam would sing this so beautifully, like a bird, poo 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 poo, and everyone called her. She is the poo poo queen. She's the poo poo queen. We're gonna call her Pua, and that became her professional name because that was the song that she used to sing. Now, I want to make the following statements. I know how to say this um, with proper attitudes, but uh, but uh, the proper way to say this is Rabbi. I find this offensive. That's what you should be saying at this moment now. And it is offensive, okay? I'm making a joke out a bit, but let's step back for a moment and think about it. Let's be honest. Miriam, with all the incredible things that she did, the first time we meet her is as the poo, poo queen. What's with that? What is that? Why is that? Why is that respectful? I don't mind if we find out that she was professionally a midwife. It's a very, it's an amazing job, but why do we have to be introduced to her as the poo, poo queen. So I'm going to share with you now one of the most, um, um, for me, most incredibly beautiful and important um, ideas that I ever heard from Rabbi Rucham of the Mir. Uh, I, since I happen to know some of the students in front of you, anyone that wants, please feel free to WhatsApp me. I happen to have in my possession recently given to me by uh, my dear friend Rabbi Yitzchak Stown. He made for me this little chart that has Menachem Nissel, and then my Rebbe, Rosh Hashanah his Rebbe, Rebbe Rucham, and his Rebbe, the Alta Mikkel, and so on, back to the Gra, and all the way back to Har Sinai. If you want, I could send it to you, and you can put your name over there, and then you can say, I learned from Rabbi Nissel, and you can see your Maser that goes back, and, and a student to teacher, a teacher to student, all the way back to Har Sinai. Be that as it may, I want to give you over one of the most incredibly important and beautiful ideas of Rabbi Rucham of the Mir. Before I do so, I would like to just to say the following words, even although I'm not going to explain myself in detail because it's not the point of today's share, but I do want to say it anyhow. What I want to say to you is that my Rebbe, Rabbi Shapiro, I have two Rebbeim, both of them are now in Shemayim. Rabbi Shapiro gave a share once where he said something different. He said that um, every single Jewish child 
had a, was had a hashba inside of them from Yecheved and Miriam. Yecheved is the power of touch, and Miriam is the power of speech. Uh, what that means is obviously a very deep, deep idea. Uh, today, the purpose of today's class is not a deep, deep idea, rather a, a, an important machshava concept. But I just want you to know that there is another answer to the Shifra and Pua concept. Shifra is the Kayach of Yadayim, and, and Miriam is the Kayach of Dibo, and both of them transferred these kokos into the 600,000 Jewish children. How that works exactly, I don't know, but these are more like um, Kabbalah-type ideas. I want to get back to Rabbi Rucham, and I want to share with you his big idea. Before I do that, I would like, um, excuse me, thank you, by the way, I, by the way, I appreciate uh, anyone that wants to ask a question, should just type them out. The word hashba uh, has two different meanings. The simply means, means influence, but when we say hashba in a more like, like a, um, a deeper sense, the word hashba is really what I'm trying to do to you now is uh, beforehand you're thinking one way, if I teach you Torah in purity correctly, so I mashpia on Yagiva hashba to see things now on a deeper level. That is what I'm trying to do over here. So the word hashba always means to influence. Um, so, so let's go back now and try and understand uh, what's happening over here with Shifra and Pua. But before I do that, I want to introduce you to another Jewish hero. And his name is Rabbi Hanina ben Tradion. His story appears in the Gemara in Abu Dazar Daf Yud Ches. Rabbi Hanina ben Tradion will be familiar to some of you when I say to you the following words. Do you remember the story of the 10 martyrs? The 10 martyrs. The 10 martyrs were 10 uh, uh, leaders of the Jewish people in the times of the Romans. And they were, each one of them was uh, murdered in, with its own unique cruelty, ostensibly to atone for the sin of the sale of Yosef. It's a crazy, crazy, crazy story. And um, we read it over in tears on Tishabab and then again, dramatically on Yom Kippur. And it's a very, very powerful narrative. Most famous of all, of course, is Rabbi Akiva, but uh, possibly second is Rabbi Hanina ben Trajan. Why? Just because of the pure, the pure imagery of him teaching Torah in public with his Sefer Torah, carrying his Sefer Torah, and fearlessly teaching Torah to the masses in defiance of the Romans. So what happened was, is that obviously he was sentenced to death. You probably know the ending of the story. Um, it was horrible, horrible, horrible ending to the story. The story was he was wrapped around with a Sefer Torah. They put sponges on his heart. Uh, for those of you that think that this is something that's, that cannot possibly be, if you go to Rome, and you honestly should go to Rome, it's one of the most uh, extraordinary cities. Uh, I, again, I'm a big fan of you Americans coming to, to Israel, make a stopover in Europe and get to see Europe. Uh, Europe is an incredible, incredible, first of all, it's a lot of fun but uh, it's also incredibly educational. You go to Rome a little bit, uh, you learn Jewish history there, and there you go to this awful place called the Colosseum. Tens of thousands of Jewish lives were lost over there. And there you'll see they quite, without embarrassment, they tell me that they, during the halftime show, this was before they had, uh, I don't know who they have nowadays, uh, which, uh, which the last halftime show in, in, um, in the Super Bowl, I'd, I'd forgotten but probably whatever it is, some famous female singers. And then they used to take slaves and they used to literally throw them to the lions. Uh, that was the halftime show. I actually, this is my own thought, which I want to throw in because it's just fascinating and it's very sad. The last words of the Teichacha in Parashat Kisavo is that it says, and you will be sold to slaves and no one will buy you. I asked him, who cares if no one will buy you? Why is it such a punishment? But you go to the Colosseum and you'll see they used to take those slaves that no one would buy. And that was the animal fodder. That's how they used to die. Those of you that ever went to a, an American wedding and whatever, the father of the bride gets up and tells this awful joke about how you know the lion comes running out to attack the little Jew and the Jew whispers something into the lion's ears and the lion turns around and says, and just sits down and won't attack the Jew. And in the end, they have to free the Jew. That's the rule. But they ask him, what did you whisper to the lion that made him uh, walk away, and he says, don't you know 
that after dinner there's going to be speeches. Whatever. Okay, it's it's funny. It's a dad joke. I'm sorry. Okay, anyhow, back to what I wanted to share with you in the Colosseum. It says that the, the sadism of the Romans, that they invented uh, these, these very tight T-shirts that they used to put over the slaves, and there were two layers, and in between they used to stuff the this uh, this um, this material that uh, that doesn't catch fire, so the person would die slowly, and therefore the entertainment would last longer. Talk about evil. This is what they did to Reb Chanina ben Tradion, as you probably remember, that his executioner um, uh, offered to take it out, and uh, he jumped in with him and died with him, and. It says that the voice came out of heaven and says that Rebbe Chani ben Tradion and the executioner invited to the world to come. And other, and they saw the, the letters of the Sefer Torah were Parchus Ba'avir. Everyone knows the dramatic ending to the story. But my question to you is what happened before the death of Rebbe Chani ben Tradion? And the Gemara says something bizarre. It says that beforehand he went and visited Rebbe Yossi ben Kisma. Who was Rabbi Yossi ben Kisma? Kisma spelled, I don't know, Kuf Yitz Samach Mem Aleph, K-I-S-M-A. He was, let's say, the senior rabbi of the generation. I'm just guessing. Um, I'm 61. So imagine that the, and, and Rabbi Gershon Edelstein is uh, in his 90s. So the God of the is, imagine that's Rukhani ben Shadion and Rabbi Yossi ben Kisma. So he goes to Rabbi Yossi ben Kisma and he says to him, do I have a place in the world to come? Do I have a place in the world to come? What would Billy Eilish say at this moment? Like, duh, hello. Okay, what are you thinking? This is the most ridiculous thing I've ever heard. Honestly, this is this is uh, obviously you're defying the authorities. You're going against the the status quo. The Romans are running this place, and they're forbidding you from teaching terror. And you go and you teach terror. You're one of the greatest people of the generation. What do you mean? Do I have a place in the world to come? So the answer is even stranger than the question. So he says, uh, he says, uh, Kisma said, did you ever do a mitzvah? Like, super duh, hello, of course, did you ever do a mitzvah? And then he answers and says that once upon a time, I had this like tzedakah box. And in that tzedakah box, I had actually two tzedakah box. One was for for, for regular charity, one was for the Purim, and uh, it's not exactly clear what happened, but somehow or other the tzedakah boxes did not uh, um, uh, match out the way he thought it did, so he took from his own pockets and he evened out the numbers. So Rabbi Yassi Mekisma says the following words, and he says, if this is what you did, he says, I wish, I wish that my place in all of Abba should be with you. So Rabbi Yassi Mekisma, the, the elderly sage, says to you, Rabbi Hanim, this is what you did with the charity boxes, I want to be with you. And this whole Gemara begs, Darshani, explain to me what is going on over here. What does it mean that my place in the world to come is it because I did something with my charity boxes in my own home? What is going on? This is a Jewish hero with all the trappings of a Jewish hero on every single possible level. Okay, now comes the drum roll because I'm about to say to you this big, big, big idea, and the rest of the class is nothing more than filling in the missing pieces. And um, I, I want very, very much to say it well and to explain it well, and I want this not just to go into your brains, and I see some of you are taking notes, and Ashrechem, I want to go into, into your heart. I want this not just to be a terror lesson, but it should be a terror life lesson, something that will affect you so deeply that from now until the end of your life, you will never ever forget this little message. It did it for me, it's done it for others, and it's so simple and so powerful. And uh, and uh, and if you've never heard this, again, I'm extremely, extremely excited to say it over to you. By the way, as I'm sp speaking to you, there's a Miriam who is joining us in the shir over here. So whoever Miriam is, uh, Miriam in the black box, she is. She should know that this class is dedicated in your honor, as we shall see in a moment. Here is the big idea, and I quote to you. Rabbi Rucham says, I'm going to first say the phrase in Hebrew. I'm going to translate into English, and then the key is the second phrase. It's the additional phrase, right? He ain't bebria, leidvarim ketanim, gulaydvarim gedailim, ela yesh anashim gedailim, 
v'anashim ketanim. Meaning, translation, ki'ein b'brir, meaning in, in this world, meaning in proper terror hashkafa, in pure terror thought, there is no such thing as small deeds and big deeds. Rather, there are small people and big people. Again, the in healthy terror perspective, in the terror way of thinking, there's no such thing as small deeds and big deeds. Rather, there are big people and small people. But this is the, the kicker is the next line. And you can only tell who is a big person by how they do small deeds. You can only tell who is a big person by how they do small deeds. So now I want to teach you something incredibly important. First of all, I want to say something that I learned from my father. And I'm saying to you now, not rabbi to students, but really like a father to a daughter, is that we live in a world where you have to be extremely, extremely careful when you see people with charisma. I'm not saying that charisma is intrinsically a problem. I'm saying charisma is very easy to abuse. As I talk to you, I'm dealing with two stories that are unfolding about abuse of rabbinical charisma to hurt people. I mean, horrible, horrible stories. Both of them, I can't say even a drop more because they're stories that are unfolding. But for you ladies, every time you hear these stories, it should hurt you, but it should not hurt you. It should also awaken you that just because a rabbi has a beard and just because he has a ability to speak. And also let's throw it in so, so that we're not talking about me, someone who's brilliant, right? There are people who never wasted a second. They all, and in their mind, they know everything and they're phenomenally powerful speakers and they've written books and everyone says, ooh, and ah, and everyone talks about them. This does not make them into big people. It makes them into famous people. It makes them into heroes in the secular sense, Jewish heroes in the secular sense, but does not make them into a big people until you see how they do small deeds. And this is the nature of our gadolim. Our gadolim, a lot of them were charismatic. Rukhaim Kanyeski, I don't know if he had charisma or not. He had his own style, but uh, Roshach for sure had charisma, right? A lot of gadolim uh, that I knew, Rumi Shapiro and Revolba were oozing with charisma. I mean, Moshe walked into a room and everyone would immediately notice him. He had so much charisma. But, 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 that's not what made him great. That was a gift from Hashem. His, his presence, his, uh, his, his genius is a gift from Hashem. And even to a certain extent, his asmada, his ability to focus, was also a gift to Hashem. I'll tell you what's not a gift from Hashem. The, I'm speaking to you now from my house, a couple of feet from where we are, are now. He once came to visit us. The story was, is that we had neighbors that uh, whatever, there was a fight going on in our building and uh, he came to solve the problem. As is his way, he always does what's called the elegant solution. He always somehow figures out how to make everyone feel good and everyone feel they came out on top. But when he came in, we had a cleaning lady. Her name is Sarah. And Sarah goes up to the, the, the rabbi and says, Kvodorov, would you like a glass of tea? Whatever, she felt at home in our house. Would you like a glass of tea? And the rabbi said, no. And that was the end of the conversation. And she carried on cleaning. An hour later, Ramesha leaves the house. Uh, we live on the third floor. Um, he walked down the second floor, first floor. Suddenly, he suddenly says, oh my gosh, okay, I forgot. Yeah. Fine. Okay, so he runs up the stairs. He sort of intimates he does not want me to follow him. I did not listen. I followed him. He runs into my house, goes from room to room to room to room to room. He finds the clean lady and says to her, goodbye, and that was it. And now he's ready to leave. He felt it was important to say goodbye to a clean lady. And that's the moment that I saw true greatness. Because that's the moment that he filled in my in my mind, the Rabbi Rucham's rule. You only see true greatness and how people do small little things. That small little thing shows that everything else about him, all his charisma and his teachings and the 50 shurim that he gave a week, whatever, his 30, 40 shurim he gave a week, everything was true greatness because of how he did those small little things. I'm very excited, Mr. Shem. I'm hoping 
that uh, sooner than later, uh, Art School now has the transcript, the, the, the writings of a book on Rav Moshe Shapiro that I wrote. Um, it's exciting for me to share this with you. You're like the first people to hear this. 26 essays, but with biographical sketches. And one of the stories I heard, so I guess I'm saying this live for the first time, but it's in the book, hopefully. Uh, Ramesha was in, um, it was in the, in the, in America. I'm not going to say where because of the possibility of figuring out who I'm talking about. And he's staying by the host. Whenever he has to stay by a host, so people come from all over to come and talk to him and ask his questions. So my friend witnessed this with his own eyes. Um, it was late afternoon and the sun was about to set and uh, in, and uh, he's about to have dinner. He's sitting there where they're about to have dinner and the Balabai says, Rebbe, we, we have to, we haven't done Mincha yet. Let's go and dove Mincha. So, so Ramesha sees they're about to have dinner. He says, no, no, no. Um, I'm, I'll dove Mincha on my own um, after, after dinner. So what happens is, is that the Balabai starts to figure out that he doesn't want to upset his wife. And um, uh, he runs up into the kitchen. And uh, what happens is, is that my friend whispered to Rav Moshe, says, the Rav's going to miss Mincha with a minion? I mean, what's going on over here? <laughs> this is what he said. He whispered this to my friend. He says, I, I know from the Gemara, this is kind of funny. You guys are going to think it's funny because you're ladies. So for you, it's like, it's funny how men think, right? I know from the Gemara that the difference between meat and fish you see, Mike, Ramesh's custom, he never ate meat in Kutsaris. This was his custom. For whatever reason, he never ate meat. He only had fish. So this was his second night. And he said, I know from the Gemara that fish is only good at a certain point. After it stays in the oven, then the taste, the whatever it is, the succulent taste of the fish starts to diminish. It's called in the language of the Talmud, mitstamek viralo. The more you keep it, the more it gets worse. Some of you may remember this from Hilcha Shabbos, like meat, like chalant. Okay, you keep it going, it gets better and better. So, so, so my Rebbe said, I know from last night already that the Rebbeson over here is a gourmet cook. She made me fish. It was not just a regular fish. It was kamosh It was like a, she was a whole performance. This fish was like delicious and everything with everything she did. It was a whole gourmet performance. I promise you, my Rebbe could not care less, but. A little bit, he would appreciate it. My wife, my, my, my Rebbe appreciated the food. It's not like when he put it in his mouth, he didn't, he, he, he knew how to enjoy Hashem's beautiful food. He knew how to make a bracha and appreciate it. He didn't need it, but he would still enjoy it. It doesn't make any difference. He saw the effort. He said, there's no question that today I'm getting a different fish. There's no way she's giving me the same as yesterday. She went out, she went into the supermarket. She said, I want this fish for the rabbi. And she made it the way that she knows how to make it perfect. And it's ready to come out now. So, 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 um, so, uh, so uh, I, I don't want to, you know, it's not, it's a little naively that she should feel that she's not giving me her, 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 her sheer her, her, her expertise. Um, and my friend said to the Rebbe, he says, you're exaggerating. It's just like, you're making a big deal. You're going to miss Mincha with William. At that moment, the Balabas comes in with his, with his wife and he says, uh, you know, Rebbe, Okay, you know, please, please, let's go to Mincha. I don't think you know. And 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 the Rebbeson says, Kvadarav, it's no big deal. Okay, you should go to Mincha. Don't worry about dinner. And then ask, and then he's asked the following. But by the way, you should know the fish is not going to taste the same. <laughs> right? She couldn't hold herself back. She said the fish is not going to taste the same. So you see, there's just little moments like this of sensitivity, of knowing who's your balabusta how she's dedicated into making a piece of fish. You pick up on those little things, a private moment in a private house. And then after he goes out and he speaks to 500 people, a thousand people, you see everything else that he does is true greatness by how he does small things. And, uh, and of course the converse is that if you see, and unfortunately you, I know that you see, you people have been out in the world, you see these rabbis, you go into their house, as Rav Chaim of Olavshin would say, you want to know a person? See them in their house. You go into their house and you see that he's not so nice to his wife. He's not so nice to the clean lady. He's not so nice. He doesn't give his children proper attention. Okay, so now you see that everything he does is small. Everything he does, it's all fake. Everything he does is small. So, so, I, I, so I, I want to get straight to my point now. 
And it's, I, I'm just admit it to you, it's a little awkward. You know, I'm teaching this to you, but I believe it's so, so MS. I wrote this, anyone who wants a copy of this class, I wrote it up. I wrote it up in, um, in um, I have a book called Jerusalem Gems, it's in the introduction. I'm happy to forward it to you, anybody that wants. I wrote this essay straight after 9-11. At that time then, a woman by the name of Peggy Noonan from the Wall Street Journal wrote a, a beautiful essay called The Return of the American Hero. And I'm not taking away from American heroes. The fireman, right? The fireman goes with 100 pounds of gear and he goes into the fires of 9-11 of the yeah. Twin Towers and he takes out body after body saving people. And literally, let's just imagine Fireman Joe, Fireman Joe saves 10 lives. And now he's on the front cover of, of, uh, of, um, of Time Magazine, The American Hero, The Return of the American Hero. I want to ask you an uncomfortable question. Is he a hero or is he not a hero? Okay, so I see some of your nodding faces. Yeah, there, he's a hero. He's a hero. Wait a second. What about the Menachem Nissel rule? Let's go into his house. You go into his house and you find out that in his home, he's highly abusive to his wife. Okay, let's say he was throwing alcohol. You can make up your own story. Then you see he beats his children. Every day, he beats his kids. In his home, he is a behemoth. He's an animal. I want to ask you something. Is he an American hero or not? Yes, he's an American hero. Should be on the front cover of Time. Maybe. Maybe he should be on the front cover of Time. Maybe he's an inspiration. What he did was unquestionably on its own a great act. But have we found Jewish greatness? Absolutely not. He's not a big person. He's a small person. He did something big, but he is a small person. The way that you talk to your wife, that's where we see who you truly are. The way you talk to your kids is how we see that you truly are. So this is exactly my point when we go and talk about Rabbi Hanina ben Tradion. Let's come full circle, ladies. Let's go full circle over. Let's go back to Rabbi Hanina ben Tradion. Who is Rabbi Hanina ben Tradion? On paper, he is the essence of the Jewish hero. He is the essence of the Jewish hero. Defies the authority. He speaks in front of everybody. He's not afraid. He's powerful. He's charismatic. He's, he, he's everything, right? He's a, he's a massive terror scholar. He goes to Rabbi Yossi ben Kisma and asks him a simple question. Do I have a place in the world to come? And he's asked, did you ever do a mitzvah? What does that mean? What that means is, is how do I know that what I'm doing is real, that I'm doing is actually true Torah greatness in Hashem's eyes. And Rabbi Yosef Kisa asked, did you ever do a mitzvah? I mean, show me how you do little things in the privacy of your house. So he gives him the example of the charity boxes. When Rabbi Yosef Kisa says that I wish that my place should be with you in the world to come, it's not because of what he did with the charity boxes. It's not what he did with the charity boxes. It's that the charity boxes teach us that everything else he did was truly great. Now, when he teaches Torah in defiance of the Romans, that's a Jewish hero because we found true, true Jewish greatness in a place that no one can see. I, I want to ask you a question. The word hero, what exactly is the Hebrew word for hero? It's a big word in English. What's the Hebrew word for hero? How would you say hero? You want to type it to me? It's okay. I'll save you the pain. There isn't one. Those of you who are thinking of the word gibar. So the first gibar, I mean, gibar, let's say it's not the first gibar, that's gibar is actually Nimrod, but technically speaking, Yitzhak Avina is the middle of gibar. What is gibar in that sense? means to be able to self-control. Gibar, Jewish gibar. Is 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 uh, is 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 a, is a spiritual concept that a person can be physically strong and he can still hold himself back from his temptation. True gvura can be shown when you tell the truth when it's so easy to lie. All these things are, 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 are Jewish gvura has nothing to do with the word hero. Hero is a Greek concept that is always something that is so to speak out there. 
hero is always visible. Um, I don't know why I know this, but Evgenia, in a place called Aurelius, sacrificed Agamemnon in the presence of all of Greece. Okay, I don't even know what I'm saying, but it's the Arcata story that was done in front of everybody, because that's what makes a, a, a Greek hero. Greek heroes have to be visible. A Jewish hero is not visible. We don't believe in heroes because all our great people, they craved to do things privately. You go to Chomish and you'll see that every single great moment, um, almost every single great moment in the Chomish, the Akeda, Avram, and Yitzchak, and nobody else. Yaakov fighting with an angel, Moshe Rabbeinu pleading for Klai on the top of a mountain, private moments. We're not into these public expressions. There's no Hebrew word for hero because it's not a Jewish concept. Just like there's no Hebrew word for, 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 for romance. Romanti, that's not a Hebrew word. There's no Hebrew word for, for um, uh, kef. Kef is not a Hebrew word, right? Something is kef, something is fun. So it's fun. All these words are not Jewish concepts. Um, uh, just like the word I just mentioned, charisma. All these words are not things that are Jewish values, so therefore they don't exist in the world of MS. They don't exist. So when we say a Jewish hero, we're just borrowing from a Greek concept, but it's not a Jewish concept. We look for things called godless. Godless, as we said, can be seen in the small acts that people do. So now a little bit I want to talk about, about women. Because this is where how I started, this is how I want to end. Let's talk. About let's talk about the following question. I want to ask you the following question. In the year 2000, I was running a website called uh, Gemsem, uh, the Jewish Gemsem, the Jewish um, Seminary Experience. I can't remember what it was, but the idea of Gemsem was uh, that those of you that went to uh, back to Chutzaretz, the big Chutzaretz, right, you go back there and you want to stay in touch with your seminary teachers, a little bit like what you're doing right now. With uh, with with, uh, with uh, igniting the spark to keep that cash. so we had a, we had every month different teachers um, wrote articles and stuff. It's a great idea. It ran its course, came out as a book, and this is where the heroes article was originally put in. But I want to one of the things in that um, discussion was discussion about uh, excuse me. One of the things that was asked by a famous organization in the year two thousand was to do a survey amongst Gemsem readers, who was the greatest woman of the 20th century? The year 2000, there was a lot of reflection on the past century. Who was the greatest woman of the, um, of the 20th century? This is an interesting question, right? Who do you think would win? If you ask, I don't know, across the board from women, who would come number one? Probably Sarah Schneer. Would you agree with nodding head, Sarah Schneer? Probably out there. Actually, yeah, and my friend Reb Chanech Teller wrote a great book about Sarah Schneer. She was incredible, amazing, amazing woman. I want to ask you a question. Who was greater, Sarah Schneer or the Chofetz Chaim? He would win the greatest man of the 20th century, hands down, probably, hands down. It would be the Chofetz Chaim. Who is bigger, Sarah Schneer or the Chofetz Chaim? Let's be politically correct and say they were equal. Let's say they were equal, Sarah Schneer and the Chofetz Chaim. Now I want to ask you another question. It's awkward. Who is bigger, the Chafetz Chaim or his wife? Now, if you ask Menachem Nissel, who's bigger, me or my wife, the answer is easy. It's obviously my wife. But traditionally, we say, Ishtai Kegufo. They're equal. And honestly, I'd like to think, you know, I think, uh, honestly, I think my wife's greater than me, but probably, it's probably correct to say that we're a team. The Chafetz Chaim and his wife were a team. Now, I once did this to my friend Rav Pesach Kron. It was not a nice thing because Rav Pesach Kron is one of my, he's my hero. I, can, I love him to pieces. But I embarrassed him publicly and I want to ask him a chila publicly. I asked him once, we were actually in Krakow at the time, at the Sarah and uh, the building where she, which, that she built. I asked this question. I asked, quote, me didi Rafesa Kron tell me one good story. He's the greatest story. Of, he's the maggot of our generation. One good story with the Chafetz Chaim's wife. I stumped Rafesa Kron. 
she was 100% hidden. No one knows, I happen to happen to know stories about it. It's not the point I want to make. It's not the point I, want. I happen to know stories about her. But that's um, that was she was hidden. And so was, uh, you know, whatever it is. A lot of the Gedolim that we don't know, we don't know stories about their wives. Um, here and there we do. But they were basically hidden. Did they have less self-esteem than their husbands? No. Would they, would, would they, did they feel that they were missing out? No. They did their thing, their husbands did their things, and together they were a team. So that's how it always was with the Gedolim. They were always a team with their wives. So what I want to share with you is that this woman, this extraordinary woman, Miriam, she was the leader of her generation. There's no question about it. How do you know that she's truly great? Remember, I wrote this article after 9-11. And the first time I spoke this thing out was in uh, Stern College. Stern College, the young ladies, a lot of them were my students at the time, um, had seen Gehenna with their own eyes. They had, some of them went and volunteered to pull out bodies from the rubble after the whole thing. It came back to the dome smelling of death. And I want to ask you the following question. So these, these young ladies did heroic acts in the secular sense. What would happen in Mr. Hashem when they get married? When they get married and it's the middle of the night. I'll talk about my wife and myself. I mentioned my wife. And the uh, I, to, to like, I, used, I go to sleep very late, two to three in the morning. I take care of the kids to them. But after that, boom, I'm out. Baby cries at four or five in the morning. My wife is exhausted beyond, beyond, beyond belief. You can put yourself, your future self, into the story. And what do you do? What do you do? You pull your body. You know how hard it is to get out of bed when you still want to be sleeping. You go up. You go to the child. You pick up that child. You nurse the child. You cradle the child, and you sing to the child the song that you learned from your mother. At that moment, the room is dark. You're looking disheveled in your pajamas. No one knows. You know what? Not even the child knows, and not even will the child ever know if the child is male. The female has a chance because one day she'll do it for her own child. How do you feel at that moment? What is this woman at this moment? And the answer for you and for me is very clear. This is her poor moment. This is the moment that we see that everything about her is truly great. Because Miriam was capable of giving all her love and all her heart, and all her beauty, everything that would made her Miriam to this little child who was just born in exactly the same way she would defy Paro and she would lead the Jewish women and she would teach the will of Klai Israel. She did it with the same greatness. At that moment, that hidden moment, that's when you find the true greatness. And I want to say to every single one of you that you need to have that self-confidence. I, I am not in any way discouraging you from dreams. You want to be a judge or a marathon runner or whatever it is. Those are your dreams. It's exciting. You want to do, you want to build a school, go build a school. You want to start a chesed revolution, start a chesed revolution. But never forget what is your moments of greatness that we see that you're truly great. The things that no one's going to see. It's those quiet moments that you do in your own home. Never forget that Devera, who was the classic example in the secular world, of, 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 of greatness. She was a leader. She was a fighter. She was a judge that judged the Jewish people. But when she talked about herself, she called herself Aim Be Yisrael. It's the only time you see herself reflecting in Shir Svera. I was a mommy. That's what it was. I was a mother in Israel. And that was her true self description of where she was showing. This is where I found my source of true Yiddish greatness is in my own home, taking care of my kindle. And then you and I can look at her and see that everything about her was truly, truly great. So as a Shem Yisbrach, what can I tell you? I want to give you uh, this empowerment that, um, that uh, I want to give you this empowerment that every single one of you should, uh, should uh, succeed in both ends seamlessly. You should feel if you want to, that you can go out in the secular world and do great things. But most of all, I wish you the bracha of feeling strong and feeling empowered of what your natural true role is that Miriam moment, the poor moment, 
which is our introduction to this great woman, where you see her true greatness, that you should feel comfortable with that and you should do it in the most beautiful, flourishing, successful way and uh, give yourself a lot of true Jewish pride. Thank you so much for listening. Thank you. I'll stay on if anyone has questions. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, Miriam. Thank you so much. I really appreciate it. Take care. This was dedicated in your honor. How come? Be proud of your name. the beginning. How Thank come? You. Thank you. Oh, it's you. Hello, Mir. How are you doing? <laughs> oh, Hashem. I didn't understand what you were saying about the dedication part. No, I because well, you, you I think you joined us a little bit late. I came a little bit late because at I at the very beginning I asked if there any Miriams out there because this, oh. this class is about Miriam. So uh, I say, yeah, oh my gosh, the you the Miriam 